Welcome to SLP Nerdcast. I'm Kate. And I'm Amy, and we appreciate you tuning in. In our podcast, we review and provide commentary on resources, literature, and we discuss issues related to the field of speech language pathology. You can use this podcast for ASHA professional development. For more information about us and CEUs, head to our website, www.slpnerdcast.com. SLP Nerdcast is brought to you in part by listeners like you. You can support our work by going to our website or social media pages and contributing. You can also find permanent products, notes, and other handouts. Some items are free, others are not, but everything is affordable. Go to our website to submit a call for papers to come on the show and present with us, or contact us anytime on Facebook, Instagram, or at info at slpnerdcast.com. We love hearing from our listeners, and we can't wait to learn what you have to teach us. Now, time for a quick disclaimer. The contents of this episode are not meant to replace clinical advice. SLP Nerdcast, its hosts, and its guests do not represent or endorse specific products or procedures mentioned during our episodes unless otherwise stated. We are not PhDs, but we do research our material. We do our best to provide a thorough review and fair representation of each topic that we tackle. That being said, it's always likely that there's an article that we've missed or another perspective that we haven't shared. If you have something to add to the conversation, please do email us. We love to hear from you. We are so excited about today's episode. Um, if you're tuning into this episode, you are here to learn more about cultural responsiveness in working with trans and gender nonconforming persons. Um, before we get into the good stuff, we do have to read our financial and non-financial disclosures. The financial and non-financial disclosures for our guest speakers will be read um, with them as part of the interview. So for now, these are the financial and non-financial disclosures for us, your regular hosts, Kate and Amy. Um, financial disclosures, Kate is the owner and founder of Grand Bois Therapy and Consulting, LLC, and co-founder of SLP Nerdcast. Amy is an employee of a public school system and co-founder of SLP Nerdcast. Non-financial disclosures, Kate and Amy are both members of ASHA SIG-12 and both serve on the AAC Advisory Group for Massachusetts Advocates for Children. Kate is a member of the Berkshire Association for Behavior Analysis and Therapy, Mass ABBA, the Association for Behavior Analysis International, and the corresponding Speech Pathology and Applied Behavior Analysis Special Interest Group. So... Um, we are very excited about this topic and we wanted to, before the interview begins, oh, actually it really wasn't much of an interview. They really taught us everything, everything that they Yeah, know. it was more of a, of a listening and learning conversation. Yes, uh, which was so great and we can't wait to jump right into it. Um, but we wanted to pause for a second and just talk a little bit about um, why we decided to publish this episode. So first of all, um, as ASHA CEU providers, we are obligated to provide content that is relevant to the learning needs of our audience. And we have had many people write in seeking information about this topic. Um, so when we were, so when we were reaching out to people and, um, you know, trying to find people to discuss this topic, because it's very much outside of our life experiences and our clinical experiences, um, we had a few brainstorming sessions with our two incredible guests, AC Goldberg and Barb Worth, prior to recording. Um, and we realized that this topic is vast and it really can't be encapsulated into one episode. So today's focus is on cultural responsiveness training, but please stay tuned for follow up episodes where we're going to get into the clinical work of gender aligning voice modification. During the interview, AC and Barb share some information about themselves. So we're going to let you, we're going to let them give you their own background information. Uh, one thing that is worth mentioning is that AC runs an educational platform called Transplaining, and you can find it at Transplaining or Transplaining.info. And we're going to discuss this resource throughout the episode. So after we recorded, he informed us he would like to extend an offer to our SLP Nerdcast listeners, which is awesome. Um, so first, if you would like to further your professional development in this area and join his patron account, AC will waive the initial session requirement. And in order to access this benefit, 
SLP Nerdcast listeners should just message AC and let him know that they've attended his SLP Nerdcast episode. Um, and I believe the way that his um, Patreon account works is that in, you have to attend the initial episode to get access to follow-up training and follow-up courses. Um, so if you send him a message and let him know that you participated in this course, you can move on to other um, continuing education options that he has through his platform. The other thing he extended to our listeners is a, a discount on the merchandise that he sells on his platform to show allyship for this community. So if you go to transplaining.info, you can use the code NerdAlert, which I thought was really funny. It's a good code. <laughs> He's such a funny guy. Um, you can use the, cur the code NerdAlert to get a 15% discount on merchandise um, to show allyship and support for this community. So without further ado, we're very excited to share this with you. And um, thank you so much for tuning in. Today, we have the great pleasure of welcoming AC Goldberg and Barb Worth. Thank you so much for joining us, guys. Welcome. We're Thank happy to be here. Thank you for having us. AC and Barb, you are here to discuss cultural responsiveness when working with trans or gender non-conforming individuals. Before we get started, can you guys tell us a little bit about yourselves? Sure. Um, my name is AC Goldberg and I am a speech language pathologist. I've been practicing for over 16 years. My primary um, job has been in a K-12 um, setting, but I have um, a private practice where I've been seeing folks for gender aligning voice modification for, over the, for the past several years. And I run a cultural responsiveness um, platform called Transplaining um, where people can come and learn more about the um, how to include um, you know trans and gender diverse um, people in their clinical practice whether they are providing voice modification services or any other services because um, trans people exist no matter where you are and it's very important um, that we all raise our level of awareness of um, how to be inclusive in our language and with our materials um, in order to um, serve the population well to the best of our clinical abilities. Um, and it's especially important to do that work before you're meeting with anyone in, you know, a gender affirming or gender aligning voice modification setting. That's a bit That's about awesome. Me. That's where, where can we learn about your platform? How, how would our listeners learn more about that? So they could follow me on Instagram at Transplaining. Um, and they could also go to my website, which is transplaining.info. Um, and at, on my website, um, there's all sorts of, you know, um, I have an inclusive materials section. Um, I have, um, you know, ally merch. Um, and I also have all of the upcoming courses. Um, in fact, by the time this episode airs, um, I will be um, hosting a winter concert series of um, all trans and gender nonconforming um, singer songwriters, which I'm really excited oh, that's about. That's awesome. Um, so, you know, there's a lot that goes on with the platform, but the primary um, goal of the platform is to, you know, be informative and it's an educational safe space where people can come and learn um, about how to interact with trans and gender nonconforming people and how to be inclusive, no matter their work setting. That's awesome. That's fantastic. Hopefully our listeners will go, go on over to your Instagram page and check, check all of your resources out. Barb, how about you? Tell us a little bit about yourself. So, yes, um, I am Barb, and I have been a speech-language pathologist for over 25 years, which is hard to believe, uh, mostly in medical settings, and mo more recently on a major uh, hospital here in the Boston area, and that is where I started working with individuals who wanted to align their voice with, uh, better align their voice with their gender. So I started doing that type of work, and then I actually uh, sort of switched gears a little bit and came to Emerson College, where I've been for three years, and I am a clinical instructor there, and I um, continue that type of work. I am training the next generation of speech-language pathologists to do this type of work. So we have a very robust clinic uh, at Emerson College where we see uh, people for gender affirmation um, voice work. So that's what I've been doing. 
That's, That's super so cool. That's so great. And we're so grateful to have both of you here to um, walk us through this. And um, in all of our conversations and preparing for this episode, we discussed the importance of reviewing cultural competency um, prior to beginning the actual clinical work of um, the voice modification. Um, and this is the beginning of a series that we hope to publish with you guys. Do you wanna talk any more about that? Sure, you know, I wanna say that obviously we're gonna start um, with the cultural responsiveness element because cultural competency, you know, it's never something that's achieved with one course or one, you know, or one lesson or one book. It's an ongoing, you know, evolution of, um, someone's learning that, you know, helps them better understand and serve a population over time. And because language is dynamic and changes over time, it's really important that people, um, you know, stay tuned into, you know, what the most current terminology is um, in this area, because terminology changes. And, you know, we want to make sure that um, people don't, you know, tune in and say, well, I've got my cultural responsiveness hour, and now I'm ready to forever, um, you know, provide this service. Um, what we hope to do, you know, in um, a subsequent um, episode or two is actually talk about the voice work, and I'll let Barb chime in with that. Sure. And I just want to piggyback on that, that I can just say that, you know, in the almost 10 years that I've been doing this, the language piece of it, you know, does continu continually change and evolve. And I, I do think it's really important. And if you don't have the right terminology, you don't understand the terminology, you haven't updated your competency, um, you know, you could... Um, end up being offensive to someone, which is the absolute last thing that we want. We want to create safe spaces. So uh, yeah, so very, very important. But yes, I, we're hoping to continue this work and provide some uh, training for your listeners w uh, with regards to providing gender affirming voice work. And so that's to come. I'm so excited. so excited. I hope everybody is just as excited as me. Um, and so, yes, yeah, stay tuned for those coming in the future. Before we get into all the good stuff, the powers that be require all the boring things be read aloud, such as financial and non-financial disclosures. So I try to get through them as quickly as I can. Are you going to be one of those like really, really fast Pete speakers? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I talk about that all the time. It's like the, the, the um, side effects. machine man from when <laughs> the, I was the uh, side a effects kid. reel that yes. gets like, you know, read. So yeah, Sounds I will great. try and be, I'll try to be fast. Um, AC Goldberg's financial disclosures. AC works for a K through 12 school district and runs a cultural responsiveness learning platform called Transplaining. AC's nine financial disclosures. Um, AC is a person of transgender experience, which gives him personal perspective. Barb Worth's financial disclosures. Barb is a clinical and academic instructor um, in communication sciences and disorders at Emerson College. She instructs students in the delivery of voice services to all populations. Barb's non-financial disclosures. She has a decade of experience working with the transgender non-conforming um, population. Uh, learning objectives for today. Learning objective number one, identify ASHA policy and resources as well as federal legislation guiding inclusion and service provision to gender diverse populations. Learning objective number two, describe appropriate workplace and educational practice policies and processes for inclusivity of gender diverse populations. And finally, learning objective number three, provide two clinical recommendations for successful service delivery of services for patients, clients, and students, regardless of gender presentation. Very it's exciting. Gonna be, it's going to be good. Um, AC and Barb, take it away. Tell us all of the things. Sure. So AC, should we start with maybe some of the information that we think that they will learn during sure, this you hour? Go ahead with this, this one. Sure. Okay. So the first question that we hope that they can answer is, does the term gender spectrum apply to you? The second question is, what does it mean when someone is intersex? The next question, what is non-binary gender? What should you do if you don't know someone's pronouns? True or false? Transgender, gender non-conforming competence training is only relevant in gender affirming voice settings. And lastly, true or false, I know how Ash's code of ethics and guidance on cultural competence applies to being gender inclusive. So 
I want to start by, you know, laying some foundational work. Um, very often as, you know, as adults, service providers, you know, parents, colleagues, community members, when we see someone who doesn't fit into a construct that we perceive to exist, like the gender binary, we attempt to change that person's mind about how they want to look, how they want to seem, how they want to present themselves. Um, so, um, you know, staggeringly, um, when you um, look at data that the Trevor Project collected in 2020, um, six out of 10 LGBTQI youth said that someone attempted to change um, their sexual orientation or gender identity. And um, it, I have a graphic here that if any listeners want to see, we'd be happy to include. Um, but, you know, it shows that um, it, school teachers and healthcare providers make up about 10% of the people who attempted to change someone's um, gender, um, gender um, or sexual orientation. But the rest of the um, little circle here that shows who tried to change um, someone's gender or sexual orientation um, parent and caregiver makes up a large component of it, um, and so does friend or other relative, and religious leader makes up about 13% of it. But when you think about that, we are all potentially parents or caregivers. We're all friends. Um, we're all someone's other relative. Um, and, you know, we are all healthcare providers or work in educational settings. So, you know, speech language pathologists make up a large component of people who might, you know, accidentally say to someone, not meaning them any harm, like, oh, are you sure that that's right for you? Do you really want to, you know, um, have you really thought this through? Aren't you making your life harder? And that takes a real toll. Um, on, you know, on people's mental health when they're coming out and they're being vulnerable. Um, and I'm, you know, not saying that to be presumptive that any one of the listeners, um, you know, tuned into this podcast would do something like that. But that's something that happens to us is that we're challenged very frequently by people because we don't fit their notion of a binary gender, which is just a construct. Um, so, um, you know, we have um, a lot of terms that we wanted to find up front for all of you. First one that I wanted to define is the difference between sex and gender. So we need to remember that sex has to do with our biological attributes, our anatomy and our chromosomes, but gender is very different. And this is really based upon socially constructed roles, a person's behavior, their expression, their identity. So, you know, I, unfortunately, you know, we do live in a binary society, but more and more we are becoming more accepting in our society of other genders, which we will talk about, about being a gender, um, and this also this concept of gender continuum or spectrum. So um, the gender spectrum, a gender spectrum is a fully inclusive term. Um, that includes um, everyone's gender unless they are agender and someone who's agender um, feels that gender is not a construct that can be put upon them. Um, but, you know, and they may or might, may not say I'm agender, which is a non-binary um, gender. They might just say, no, I'm agender. But gender spectrum is a fully inclusive term that um, includes everyone's gender identity and presentation. And really, you know, it's not like a continuum where you start, you know, where you think of the gender spectrum that must start with manly man and end with feminine woman. Um, it's, you know, I think of this as sort of like a broad, beautiful um, array of colors where anyone can sort of fall in any place and they can, you know, be someone who's, you know, has a masculine appearance, but, you know, an effeminate, um, you know, an effeminate affect or, you know, has, you know, a feminine appearance and an effeminate affect. And it's not something that, um, it's not something that's always fixed. Um, it's something that can change over time. But a lot of um, cisgender people, and cisgender is a term I'll define in a second, 
don't take a minute to reflect about where they may fall on the gender spectrum because they know things like, oh, you know, I like to get my nails done and I like to, you know, and I like to put on my heels and, you know, I'm, I'm all well and good with everyone's gender, you know, presentation, regardless of whether they're cisgender or transgender. Um, but people don't often take a time to think, you know, well, I'm on the gender spectrum. I wonder, you know, how do I present my gender? You know, how does, how is my gender reflected in my, in my appearance and in my mannerisms and in the way that I present myself? Um, so, you know, now might be a good time to think about, you know, where do I fall on the gender spectrum? How do I show my gender to the world? You know, what, what is it about me that demonstrates my gender to other people? Well, AC, I'll say as a cisgender person that and, and someone who has been thinking more and more about gender, that concept really is interesting to me, I have to say. And I'm thinking more and more about that. So let's define cisgender, all right? Because we've been using that term and exactly. we haven't, de we we haven't defined it. it. Okay, so, so. A cisgender person like <laughs> Barb um, is someone whose gender aligns with stereotypical traits of the sex they're assigned at birth. Um, you know, and when I say that, I mean, you know, stereotypical traits that, that society puts on them based on the sex that they're assigned at birth. Um, so, you know, a cisgender person is someone who was assigned female at birth and um, as their sex and their gender is feminine presenting. Um, so if your gender does not align with stereotypical traits of the sex you were assigned at birth. Um, you could be transgender, non-binary, agender, genderqueer, gender fluid. There are so many different words and terms that people use to um, define their genders that we can't make an exhaustive list because we would leave someone someone out, you know, and I wouldn't want to, you know, pretend to make an exhaustive list. I do think that agender, though, is something that probably some people aren't as as um, as knowledgeable about. Can you address that, AC? And I sure. just want, also wanted to say for our listeners, um, when you're using the word agender, you don't mean a space gender, as in like you're a gender, as in like the article A and the word gender. You mean a g e n d e r, mm -hmm. or as some people in the area might call it agenda. Um, <laughs> For we those of you listening, not New well. England, that was an awesome Boston accent. Right? Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, someone who's agender, you know, really feels that they don't have gender. It's the absence of gender, that gender can't be put upon them as a construct because it doesn't vibe with who they are as a person. Um, and they might, you might see them and think that, you know, and want to attribute their gender presentation to a specific identity, but you're wrong. Um, and you cannot tell someone's gender or gender identity by looking at them, nor can you tell it by knowing their pronouns. Um, that's something very specific that you would have to know about someone and that they may not share. Yes, Barb's got her hand up. I do have my hand up because the other one that as a cisgender person who is really, really trying to be culturally competent, the term queer, can you talk about your perspective about that term queer and me as a cis person and me as a cis uh, speech language pathologist who's providing this kind of service, should I be using that word queer? Can you, can you talk about that? You know what's, what, uh, you know, uh, uh, the audience is going to get to know a little bit about me, but it's interesting because I know that, you know, um, I've never actually defined myself as queer. Um, even though it's something that completely applies to me, um, simply because I, you know, was never a part of the community that used that term to, to define themselves. So, you know, I think that that's also one of those sort of deeply personal things that some people will be like, you know, oh, I'm queer because I fall within like, I like to say the broader rainbow community. Um, a lot of people will use the term queer and define it as, you know, and say like, oh, well, I'm queer or they're queer or, you know, um, they'll use it as some sort of an umbrella term to, you know, encompass the, the LGBTQIA, you know, plus, um, you know, um, population and, and, you know, it's not a bad word and it's certainly not a slur when it comes from the person who's describing themselves. And I'm sure it would never be a slur coming out of your mouth, Barb. Um, 
And I don't think that it would be even irresponsible for you to say like, oh, I work with the queer population, mm -hmm. um, but it wouldn't be a good idea for you to call someone queer because, you know, that's when we get into things where if someone doesn't use that term to define themselves, that could be a microaggression, which is a term we'll discuss later on. Kate and I think that this is such a sort of harking back to something you said in the beginning of the episode about how language changes and how your cultural competency is so important um, to continually work on if you're going to do this kind of work. I mean, even just thinking of the word queer and my personal definition of that word, even prior to this conversation could have been different. It was certainly used differently when I was growing up in the eighties, you know? So, you know, these things, they evolve and change over time. And I think it's so important to reflect on that and make sure that you're continuing your cultural competency journey as a, as a human, particularly if you're cis cisgender and doing this kind of work. Right. And my understanding too is that it was a derogatory term yes. um, that, yes. that, the, that the community then embraced. Mm -hmm. yes, um, yes. And yes. And so, and I agree, uh, you know, AC with, you know, I really try to use the words that my client, my patient is using. I don't make up words or apply words to someone. I listen to how they describe themselves. But I think you saying something like, I'm, I'm a queer ally, like wouldn't offend anyone. You know, um, but, you know, that is one of those words that, you know, when we think about um, what we said in the beginning, that language is dynamic and evolves over time, you know, that's a word that at one point couldn't have been used. Right. Um, but is now used very widely. So um, the next term we're going to define, or I'm going to touch on briefly is intersex. And I'm going to touch on this more briefly than I normally do. You might see this in charts, you know, especially if you work with medically complex, um, you know, peds, um, because oftentimes intersex conditions coincide with other, um, other genetic conditions that um, cause language delays. However, um, that is definitely not the case for most intersex people. And um, intersex is an umbrella term. Um, for um, people who have either a different, you know, chromosomal or hormonal makeup. Um, every one in 1000 people has an intersex condition. Um, it's as common as having red hair. Um, and everyone is going to be assigned a binary gender at birth, even people who are intersex. Um, it's actually, you know, most people who are intersex, um, if they're born and their bodies look different, um, it's the standard of practice for doctors to operate on them and make their bodies conform um, to a binary appearance, just as an infant, um, without considering sort of the long-term psychological effects of not giving someone bodily autonomy. Um, so intersex is a term that some people might use to define their gender, but other people, it might just be something you see in a chart and you just table it. It probably has nothing to do with their gender identity, but it's a medical term that you might come across. And when you see it, I don't want you to make any assumptions or anyone to make any assumptions about what that person is going to look like or how their or what their gender or gender identity is going to be. Um, and when we think about you know um, how we attribute or how we sort of perceive people's genders. You know, what we're, what we're thinking about is what someone's body looks like, what their expression is, you know, do they, do they have, you know, long hair and makeup and nails and a dress on? Do they have, you know, short hair um, and a tie on? Um, are they, you know, do they have, um, you know, facial hair or um, yes, uh, as you said, like a dress or pants, Yes. Or any sort of, you know, any sort of way that you can, you know, that you can show sort of a, a difference in your gender by, by your expression um, and things that you choose. Expression are things that, you know, you choose and your body, you can't choose your body. Um, but that's what other people attribute your gender to. So when someone looks at you, they look at your body and they look at the things that you use to express yourself. And that can even include your communication style, of course. Um, but your gender identity is something that's internal. And nobody can actually tell what your gender identity is by looking at you. Um, you know, they can only tell what you look like and how they perceive you. I was just going to say for our listeners, there are some really nice graphics up here on the screen too. So if you are somebody who is also a visual learner, just check out AC's website because 
some of these some of these concepts I'm finding a lot of this is new to me and being able to look at visuals that go along with these big ideas has been really helpful. Agreed. And we will have links to all of this on our, on the episode page and in the show notes. I would love to talk about pronouns because, you know, it's really something that I think we're getting used to being in more and more spaces in which people, for instance, introduce themselves with their pronouns or um, there's a lot of been a lot of discussion about pronouns. So I'd love to turn sort of the topic to that. Um, AC, I know you, you, you know about the Pew Research Center's study. What you want to tell us about that? You know, this is just one of many studies that um, have been done recently about people's um, comfort in using um, gender neutral pronouns. So the Pew Research um, Center did a study and just asked adults, do you feel comfortable using gender neutral pronouns such as singular they? And the most staggering part of the graphic that's on our screen right now is that 47% of all adults said that they don't feel comfortable, um, that they feel uncomfortable using gender neutral pronouns, which, you know, that's a lot of adults. Um, you know, 47% said that they were not comfortable. 23% um, of those said that they were very uncomfortable using, using gender uh, neutral pronouns and 24 said, uh, percent said they were somewhat uncomfortable. We used to use pronouns like the and thou. How is they <laughs> a stretch from those, you know? And we use the singular they all the time. Who left their sweater here? I mean, I would never say like who left his or her sweater here. I would say, you know, like oh, someone left their <laughs> someone left their water bottle, you know, in in my in my room, you know, like it, like if you can find out who they are, I would never say, you know, if you can find out who he or she is, like. You know, we use it's them clunky. all the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's too clunky. We use gender neutral pronouns all the time without noticing it. Um, but people really, you know, freeze up when they're, you know, asked to talk about, about a person. Um, and I just think that that's silly because we use these pronouns anyway. They're already pronouns that we use a lot of the time, but there are some that are not. Um, so let's talk about, yeah, all those, you know, the, the Z and Zay and, um, you know, can you talk to us about that? Um, sure. So there are, um, there are um, like a whole host of um, what people call neo-pronouns. And what's funny is that I really should ask someone who uses um, pronouns. I know people who use like see her pronouns and people who use co um, as a pronoun. And I'll talk to you about, about that in a second. But um, you know, terming them neo pronouns when they were being used before the singular they was, um, you know, in common parlance and accepted as sort of like the most, you know, commonly used um, pronoun of people uh, who have non binary genders. What we're terming these now are neo pronouns. And I'm not even sure if people who use them would be comfortable because the um, terming them as neo pronouns because, you know, are they are they new to to them? No, they're new to everyone else. Um, and you know that sort of I don't know how anyone um, who uses them would feel about that. But you know what we have on the screen right now is a graphic we can also share with listeners, which is just um, the various forms of a few different alternate pronouns. Um, you know we have here you commonly might hear see and hear um, as you know a pronoun that other people use, and I have sort of. Um, things listed in a chart like Z wrote careful, uh, carefully researched article. I called Zier. Zier, um, Zier carefully researched article won an award. That's research, that research is Zier's. Um, Z cited Zier self. Um, and, you know, it's important that as SLPs, and I won't read through all of these, but it's important that as SLPs, we have access to this type of information because if you're working with a, you know, with someone who's family member uses these pronouns, you're going to want to know how to use them in their various forms. It's not just about the person you're working with and being able to talk about that person or write about that person. It's about, it's about programming, programming an AAC device um, that has the correct terminology to, you know, refer to your client's family member. Kate has her hand up. I, I, have, a, I have a difficult question. I feel like this is a safe place and I can ask a difficult question. Oh, perfect. Right? <laughs> so, um, I think as a, as a cisgender person, I have had the experience of 
having a hard time remembering to use they just because as a fluent linguistic speaker, I have to catch myself and pause and really focus just because of my learning history with my own language. And I, I think that that is a little different than someone who thinks it's wrong or doesn't believe that people should have different pronouns. If you're having trouble remembering, so, you know, Kate, I want to kind of go back to the beginning of your question was like that, you know, it's not that you have any sort of, you know, any sort of thing against, um, uh, it's not that you have anything against using um, the singular they as someone's pronoun. In fact, mm -hmm. you would be happy to call a non-binary person who uses that pronoun, um, you know, by their correct pronoun, but it's hard for you to remember. I recommend practice. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, like, it comes to, it, for me, it, it becomes this, it's so, to, like an automated. It, so, you know, just the same way that, you know, you might have to practice someone's new name, like, you know, when a colleague gets divorced and goes back to a name that they used to use a million mm -hmm. years ago, yes. and you flip back and forth in your head, and sometimes you have to be like, you have to do a little bit of rehearsal, um, and make sure that you're like, oh, you know, um, we're going to see Ms. Brown. Um, you know, like just making sure that you don't accidentally call her Miss Black. Um, you know, you, like just Amy's doing laughing some rehearsal. because she got married and I still can't switch over to her new name. <laughs> um, but so, so, so you you're know, right. I mean, it's practice. And it's it's it practice. Is. And what I think you should do is do it out loud um, or name, you know, get a fish and, you know, and give it a gender neutral pronoun or give it Amy's um, I love that um, idea. New, new last name um, I love or just, that idea. you know, practice like um, my friend Amy, she drives to work in her car when she got her car, like, you know, just kind of reminding yourself, like, you know, Amy's pronouns are she and her, or, you know, or if you were, you know, practicing with someone whose pronoun was the singular, they would do the same thing. Just getting it sort of into your lexicon and mm -hmm. cementing it with that person's name will help. And that'll be easily transferable because once you have that skill set with one person and their name, mm -hmm. you can transfer that very easily to someone else and their name. And I, you know, I will be completely upfront. You know, I'm a transgender person and I at first, you know, had a hard time when um, someone I know um, started using the singular they, like it, it felt awkward to me. And I was mm -hmm. like, oh, you know what? I'll have to practice this. Our learning I... histories with pronouns is long. I mean, you know, you're, you're relearning the automaticity of a linguistic rule. And I think yeah. that that's, it's okay to need to practice. But, and it's also okay to mess up. I yeah. mean, you know, if you, if you, and we'll talk about that, but you know, if you misspeak, you, you'll learn how to just minimize it, model and move on. And, you know, feeling like, oh my gosh, I got it wrong. Like putting that much pressure on yourself, like put the pressure on yourself to practice, but not to be perfect. I mean, you know, I misspeak all the time and I'm not just talking about pronouns. I mean, I just, you know, sometimes I say the complete wrong thing. Um, and, you know, that's just the nature of being human and being a language user is that sometimes we say something incorrect and then we correct ourselves and move on. And that's the important point. I think that the, the practice suggestion is such a good suggestion, such a, uh, makes sense suggestion, but something that I think a lot of us aren't doing. Um, I also just wanted to bring back up a point that you made, AC, um, just a little while ago when you were speaking, which was that it's not just if you're providing voice therapy. This is also, this is just being a clinician who's a human mm -hmm. who has family and friends who are also humans and could very easily be using different pronouns. So this is not something I think just to make the point that you, you, even if you're not thinking, oh, I'm not going to work on gender aligning voice therapy, it's these are still things that are relevant for every clinician, right? Oh yeah, Barb. Every clinician and every person. So AC and I were in a in a in a situation last <laughs> night where we there were 25 people in our virtual room, and the question was, how many people know someone who's transgender? And everybody raised their hand. So you know, so That's pronouns, whether it be they or you know someone who has changed 
their pronouns, right? So there's there there's that in itself, itself too. We need to rehearse. I used to refer to this person with these pronouns. I'm now referring to these this person with these other pronouns. Yes. And you know, one more thing that I just want to you know kind of make clear to to listeners up up front is that you know transgender and gender nonconforming people are going to exist regardless of you know where you work you know you're going to have a trans kid on your caseload you're going to meet a gender non-conforming you know student at the school where you work and you know that could have nothing to do with the reason why they're seeking you they you know they they stutter or you know they're you know one of your autistic students you know there's so many there there's so many different ways you can meet a transgender person and they could be your colleague i mean you know um it's not Go ahead, Barb. <laughs> so, yeah, I wanted to talk about, you know, the, the using pronouns in the clinical setting because, you know, something just came up w- for us at the Robin Center at Emerson College. And, you know, we've gotten very um, careful with the use of or asking people their pronouns when they're coming for gender affirming voice therapy. And I, you know, I turned to my colleagues and I said, you know, those are the only clients we're asking that we're asking their pronouns of. We should be asking pronouns for all of our clients, right? And so yeah. why are you looking at <laughs> that you're surprised? Yeah. I mean, you know, and, and, and people, you know, we sort of, yes, of course, we've gotten so focused on our gender affirming clients. We're not thinking about the, the wider body of, of people that we're seeing. And so we need to be, and not othering right? If we're just asking people that we know are trans about their pronouns, we need to be asking everyone. Exactly. I mean, yes. you know, I think that it's important to check in with, with everyone on your caseload from time to time Absolutely. Um, you know, about these things because, you know, they can change and they don't always come up. And sometimes people feel awkward bringing them up, um, especially if it doesn't feel relevant in the moment or if that's not why they're in the space with you or, you know, you don't have occasion because you're one-to-one to talk about them in the third person. Um, so what happens if you make a mistake? Um, so, if you make a mistake, and I'm going to use, you know, Barb as an example, um, you know, you just, uh, well, I've got an example up on the screen, but I can um, use Barb as an example. You just move on. If you apologize profusely to someone, um, you know, that puts the onus on them to say, you know, like, oh, oh, it's okay. You know, don't worry about it. When really, like, that creates an uncomfortable situation for the person who, you know, has just, you know, been misgendered. Um, You know, so if I said something like, you know, I'm really excited to do this presentation with Barb, you know, when I met him, when I met her, um, we clicked right away. And I was like, oh, you do this work. That's incredible. And did you see how I just, you know, I misgendered her. I, I corrected myself right away. I moved on with my statement. And I didn't say like, oh, I'm so sorry. You know, I wasn't like, you know, Barb, Barb, she, she, Barb, Barb is a she, she, Barb is a she. I should know that. I'm sorry. Forgive me. Like that would have, that makes someone very uncomfortable mm-hmm. um, when, when you do that. And what, what you'd have to do is just correct yourself, model that you know it, and then move on quickly. I know that, you know, in working with my students, they're so nervous that they're going to say the wrong thing. You know, they're absolutely, their hearts are in the right place. They really want to be doing this type of work, and they're so afraid. And so this is one of the things that, you know, we also talk about, that it is just really important to, as you said, just correct and move on. And You know, I, I want to make it clear to listeners that, you know, I make mistakes with people's pronouns and I correct myself and move on. And I don't, you know, I don't feel great when I make a mistake, but I don't feel great when I make a mistake about anything. Um, You know, so this is no more loaded than making just like a normal speaking mistake and then moving on. Um, You know, it's, you know, you want to try obviously to proficiently use your client's pronouns, but making or friend or colleague making a mistake and moving on is the best way to handle that situation. 
And I do have to say that, you know, in my years of doing this type of work, I have to say that the people that I have worked with in this line of work, my clients, my patients are the most forgiving individuals. You know, we've all, I've made mistakes, you know, and um, I, I, you know, and, and had to apologize for uh, something here and there. And I do, I do feel like the best thing to do in that situation is just to move on. So, you know, I, I, I think that um, I'd like to consider myself an ally, and I know that, you know, the I can be a good ally when I inform myself about the needs of the community. And so, you know, AC, I'm wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about microaggression and fear. Um, you know. in, yeah. Yeah, I'm happy to because, you know, transgender people live in constant fear. Um, and even before this past, you know, um, four years of really difficult, you know, political climate, um, you know, it, things were not great. Things had gotten better momentarily, um, but they, they were never great. You know, there were, there were no legal protections when I was early in my career and being fired and harassed and mistreated for being trans by other SLPs. You know, I was, I was mistreated terribly when I entered the field and that still actually happens. And, you know, there aren't um, laws in all states that protect people from that type of mistreatment, but now there are laws that um, protect people from um, being fired for being transgender. That actually um, was just a Supreme Court decision that came in June that Title IX does apply. But transgender people live in constant fear. You know, since 2016, like there's, today's the Transgender Day of Remembrance. That's our recording day. And I, I didn't acknowledge that. Um, but, you know, every year on November 20th, we, we hold space for um, transgender people who have been murdered, um, simply for anti-trans violence. And there are 37 in the U.S., um, 37 people this year um, in the U.S. that we know of. But um, the media um, very often dead names, um, and I'll get into what that is, or misgenders people upon their deaths. So we don't hear about all of these. But 37 that we know of is the deadliest year on record when you think about a very small portion of the population. And it is very important to note that this violence disproportionately impacts um, Black trans women and trans femmes of color. Um, so, you know, we really have to speak out and protect people. Um, you know, so the fear is real, you know, the, and because the, it isn't, it, it, the fear is real. It isn't just the murder. It's being banned from the military, being banned from being on sports teams, being banned from being, you know, um, from being able to access, you know, um, certain elements of healthcare that were available um, under the Affordable Care Act, um, being banned from homeless shelters, which is something that's still currently in flux. Um, that ban is like it hasn't really taken effect, but it's being argued in court. And it's the problem with all of this is that even if there are laws that say, well, no, you know, we've upheld Section 1557 of the ACA that, you know, you, you can access this type of health care. Health care providers don't know that. They don't keep current with the laws, so they'll turn people away. Um, and homeless shelters, they don't keep current with the laws. They'll see a news headline and be like, oh, you know, well, we don't allow people like you in here, um, you know, or you can't be on our sports team. And all of that's, you know, actually legally not correct. But um, these are things that have happened to us um, since 2016. Um, and all of us carry around, you know, the, the trauma. Um, so, you know, when you think about, um, when you think about the, um, the minority stress that we develop um, from all of this. You know, we have these negative experiences um, with interpersonal interaction. We have um, minority stress just from the things that I mentioned. And we have, um, and we experience microaggressions, which we'll get into in a little while, that really, you know, leads into a situation where you have to be coming at all of your um, therapy from a trauma-informed lens, um, you know, because, if you don't think about someone's lived experience, then you're not going to be the best clinician um, to that person. You know, and that applies across, you know, cross-culturally, obviously. Um, everyone sort of thinks about this for, you know, um, maybe a client who, you know, had a, like a traumatic, you know, immigration experience um, or um, Kate. 
I was just going to, I just wanted to take a second to, to highlight what you said, because I think it's so important. This, the idea of, of taking a trauma informed lens and treating the whole person. Um, Amy and I have been talking about this a lot recently about the medical model and, and how as clinicians, we try to like, you know, treat the quote diagnosis or quote, treat the problem. Um, but you're treating a person, you're providing services to a person who is bringing, a, a myriad of varied histories to um, to your table, to your office. And I, I think that that is, it's true for all of the work we do as clinicians, but this is just so, so, so important. Um, so, you know, when we talk about the, the, you know, negative experiences, you know, and the minority stress that we, ca- that we carry and um, how we need to come at things from a trauma-informed lens, we have to evaluate the clinical relevance of actually talking about someone's gender. Um, you know, like, when is that clinically relevant? So when should you ask about someone's gender? And, you know, to me, these are the three main points that jump out are for clarification, but to ask about pronouns. Like, I would never look at someone and be like, are you a woman? I would look at someone and say, you know, what are your pronouns? Um, You know, I wouldn't ask, you know, what, what label they use for themselves. I would, because that's irrelevant. I just need to know the pronouns. Um, when correcting others, if necessary, you know, um, Barb changed her name. Let's make sure it's noted properly in her chart, you know, just, just to model for other people. Um, and when that person brings it up, you know, if someone comes into your room, regardless of what, you know, what type of, um, you know, speech language therapy you're providing and says, you know, I, I want to let you know that I changed, you know, my name and, you know, um, my pronouns are he and him, or, you know, I'm transgender and, you know, I'm, you know, now I'm going to be, you know, um, taking on male pronouns and people will, will say things like that. And, you know, you say like, oh, okay, you know, who can I, who can I talk about this with? Can I write about this in your, you know, can I, can I use that pronoun in your chart? Can I use it when I talk to other people? And we'll get into that a little bit more specifically later. Um, but, how can we make sure that we're using um, inclusive um, language? And uh, I need a tiny voice break, Barb, if you want to take sure. this slide. Sure, absolutely. So I think we've talked a little bit about language and how important language yeah. is and how language has been evolving. And so it is important to to try to use non-gendered language. You know, one thing that we say a lot is, hey, guys. So, you know, it is gendered language. And so what could we say instead of, hey, guys? We could say, hey, peeps. We could use folks. We could say, we call people, just to say, hey, people. Hey, lovelies. Everyone. Everyone. What's up? What's up, people? All kinds of different options. And I actually recently saw a graphic that had even more, even, you know, very, very creative ones. But, you know, think about that. And that's something actually... I, I, I like I, to use earthlings, I was going to say, yeah, but that's, yeah. you know, I do, but I work with, um, well, not for much longer, but I work with kids. So earthlings like see, tends to get people's attention. Absolutely. So, um, you know, I, hey, future leaders of America, I don't know, you know, you could just <laughs> Make it up. So, you know, we could change, you know, and think about the language you're using. So, you know, instead of mankind, it's humankind. Instead of chairman, it's chair. You know, instead of congressman, we use legislator. So trying to select those those terms, you know, that don't, uh, that are not inherently gendered. Um, I'm trying really hard to not say something about the patriarchy, but I, I can't. I can't. Well, I can't not say exactly. Say it. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Where do these, you know, it's, it's our, our history. Yeah. Um, you know, so when we talk about, you know, inclusive language, um, you know, when you say things like, you know, every student should turn in his or her Chromebook, um, each student should wait until he or she is notified about, you know, their, uh, about his or her grades. Um, I, it's, it's clunky, and we talked about this. That's exclusionary language, and it's binary. If you want to be inclusive of anyone of any gender or any gender pronoun, they is, is a pronoun that you can use in place of those pronouns. So you can say every student should turn in um, their book by Friday. Every student should wait until their grades are posted. And it's really easy. Um, and that's inclusive 
language um, versus exclusionary language. Amy? It, it makes me think of universal design being a school-based provider. We think a lot about universal de design within the physical environment. And when I'm hearing you speak, it's making me think about just applying that same universal design to our linguistic environment, right? Yeah, yes. absolutely. This is part <laughs> of universal design. Yeah. Um, it's accessibility. Yes. Um, and that's, you know, that's where we're at. Um, so, you know, there's, there's other terms that we, that we use that um, come up that I want to make sure we address because, you know, people um, until very recently were saying things like preferred pronouns, I mean, or even still say preferred pronouns, you know, and Pronouns are not a preference. Um, they're just a fact about a person. You know, I wouldn't say Amy's preferred pronouns or she and her because, like, you know, preferred pronouns, it, it carries a connotation of, like, you know, well, she prefers that, but that's not really what you're supposed to say. Totally. Um, you know, um, there's some outdated terminology, like the word transsexual. If your client comes in and, you know, describes herself as a, you know, proud transsexual woman, then that's great and you know that's the language that you should use about that person um you know maybe not necessarily in your note writing because it doesn't you don't have all you have to know is pronouns to write notes and you don't even actually have to use pronouns in notes but um you know that's some that's language that you can use with that client but it is an outdated term um you know it's not something that's used right now um transgendered comes up a lot um and you know it's not a verb and barb your hand was up my hand was up because I think that's the, that's one that I still hear. Yeah. So I find myself as an ally, you know, help, helping to inform people about that one. Um, so, you know, then there's also people will say things like but what the biological sex, biological sex, biological sex is also a spectrum. I mean, I talked a very brief amount and I could talk for several hours about intersex um, and, you know, what that can mean. Um, but, you know, biological sex is also a spectrum and people don't want to see that on a form or hear you talk about biological sex, if especially if they're you know transgender or, or non-binary, or if they're intersex, um, because you know it feels uncomfortable to them um, that you're sort of aligning like what their gender you know should be with what you know biological sex they um, characteristics or traits they were born with. Um, you know, it's just not. It's something that you should. It's something that has to be referenced sometimes um, when you're talking about, you know, certain things like studies and things that are carried on chromosomes, of course. Um, but when you're talking about a person um, saying something like, well, you know, um, there, like if, if someone, if one of you were to talk about me, you would be saying your biological sex is female. And to me, that would feel like a microaggression. Mm -hmm. You know, if someone were to start talking about my biological sex, um, not only is it a spectrum, but it's also something that, you know, would feel highly uncomfortable to someone who, you know, was assigned a sex of birth that doesn't align with their gender presentation. When people say things like, well, what's your real name? Um, you know, even if it's because they need it for a form, um, your real name is the name that you want to be called. Um, you know, the, the four of us who are on this podcast right now, um, three out of four of us don't go by our, you know, full legal name. We're not called that. Um, and, you know, asking someone what's your real name um, has, you know, a connotation that, you know, what they're, what they're doing is acting. And so does passing. Now, passing is something that you might hear. It's a very loaded term. Um, a very, very loaded term because um, if a client uses it with you, they say, you know, I, I want my voice to, 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 I want to pass. I want my voice to be passing when I'm on the phone. I want to be able to get into an Uber and not worry that I'm not going to pass when, you know, my driver hears me speak out loud. Um, you know, when, when passing comes up, you really can only use that term if someone uses it for the, uh, when referring to something that they want for themselves, because, um, it's not something that's desirable to all people, nor is it something that's attainable to all people. One more that I want to make sure that I touch upon is identifies as, um, because that's, mm. that's one that's really important. Identifies as also carries the connotation that someone's like not really what they say they are. You know, um, 
Barb identifies as a woman is is not you know but Barb is a woman you know it like how she identifies is up to her um but you know being being a woman is is a fact about her and saying she identifies as a woman carries a connotation that she's pretending so again, as an ally, I want to hear a little bit more about laws that have been put into place that might help our uh, transgender, gender nonconforming, and um, gender uh, non-binary people. AC, can you talk about that? Sure, I can. Um, so the Civil Rights Act of 1964, um, Title VI of the Civil Rights Act, um, states that no individual on the basis of race, sex, um, color, national origin, disability, religion, age, sexual orientation, or status as a parent shall be excluded from participation in, be denied benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination in any federally conducted education, training program, or activity. And this also applies to federally funded um, institutions. So we're talking about, you know, schools and schools, clinics, and hospitals, all of which receive federal funding. I know there are private institutions that um, may say that they have exemptions from this, but actually that doesn't usually hold up in court. And Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 provides similar protection in employment. and employment Employment protection is also provided under Title IX. So Section 1557 of the Affordable Care Act um, also just, you know, it just actually held up in court, which was a surprise to us because there have been attempts to repeal it. But it also prohibits discrimination on the basis of race, color, um, national origin, sex, age, disability, um, and, and all of that in certain healthcare um, programs and activities. You cannot be denied a service by a provider um, based on um, your sex, um, which is something now that um, under Title IX also includes gender or gender presentation. Um, so Section 1557 of the ACA was on the docket to be repealed and actually held up like last week. Um, so we're still in limbo about this, but this protects us um, from being discriminated against in medical settings. And by us, I mean trans and gender nonconforming people. We, we wrote up a little clinical scenario here. Um, and Barb, you can read it and I'll drink my water. Sure. So let's talk about how, you know, some of the, this applies and what you might see in a clinical setting. So uh, let's just say, you know, you work in a university clinic as an SLP and the university hospital has a gender voice alignment clinic. And one of your gender alignment clients comes in for a hearing evaluation. The audiologist notices the client and they approach the client, the, I'm sorry, the clinical supervisor and say that they will not work with this client. And what this means is that they are misinterpreting conscience protection. So conscience protection um, applies to healthcare services, not to individuals. Um, so, you know, you could um, say something like, I, you know, I don't provide abortions because it's, it goes against my religion, but you couldn't say, I don't treat women, um, you know, um, because women could be people who, you know, are seeking an abortion. You could say, you know, I don't provide gender, you know, gender voice modification services, which, you know, would be unfortunate because it's a really great service to provide, but you could say, I don't provide that. It goes against my religion, um, which I, you know, I, I have my own thoughts about that, but you could say that, but you couldn't say, I don't work with transgender people. ASHA's policy is that um, individuals shall not discriminate in the delivery of professional services or, uh, um, <clears throat> or in the um, conduct of research or scholarly activities on the basis of ethnicity, sex, gender identity, gender expression, sexual orientation, age, religion, national origin, disability, culture, language, or dialect. So, you know, really, we're covered in terms of discrimination, um, you know, in um, spaces where SLPs would exist. And now we want to talk a little bit about that. And I really would like to talk about safe spaces and how we how we uh, we create them. But I know that you know there are some microaggressions that uh, trans individuals uh, uh, have to encounter and do encounter. And you want to talk a little bit about that, AC? Can you also just define for us what is what is a microaggression? What what I've heard that word. I'm not sure that I know what it means. So I I can define it, but do you want to define it, Barb? 
No, you go ahead. But I, oh, you know, right. so, but I do think, that, and I think the term micro is, is, is really, yeah. So let's talk about the micro part of it. So well, I first see. I'll define it and then we'll talk about the micro part of it. Yeah. Um, so a microaggression is like a brief, behavioral um, or environmental indignity um, that, you know, can be intentional or unintentional, that, you know, the, the buildup of them makes them not so micro. Um, you know, like not being able to access a bathroom on top of being called sir when you don't want to be called sir, on top of having to fill out a form that you know, makes you check off a binary gender are all things that can happen to you when you walk into a clinic or a hospital and those add up and they're not so micro when you've got, you know, when you're confronted with three in a row and, you know, they, they add up and they impact our mental health, um, you know, to, you know, an extent that, you know, only really minoritized populations can understand. Um, and, you know, some common microaggressions that people talk about is, you know, they'll talk about like, the your lifestyle like oh the lgbtqi lifestyle and you know it makes me laugh because you know i have just like this really like wholesome life that um you know i've got a couple kids and um and a cat named taco and <laughs> you know i i play the guitar and a grateful dead cover band and there's just sort of like nothing about my lifestyle that would ping any like that is so deviant deviant like radars another common microaggression that we come across is dead naming which is when you call a transgender person by the name that's on their birth certificate when you ask them super invasive questions like, oh, when did you, you know, when did you first know that something was different? Or like, you know, did you used to like to wear this? Or what kind of toys did you play with as a kid? Or have you had the surgery? I mean, you know, they can range from, you know, being very brief questions to being really, really invasive questions. Telling people you know another trans person, that just makes us feel uncomfortable like you're going to out us. I'm not transphobic, but I don't want trans women on my lacrosse team. That's that's transphobic. Um, if you've seen a picture of someone when they were, you know, pre-transition and you remark on how lovely they looked, you know, nobody wants to hear about how great you think they looked when they felt uncomfortable with their appearance. And now I want to talk about pain points because pain points are more than microaggressions. And they're, um, you know, things that come up in clinical scenarios that um, really can be avoided, like surgical history. As SLPs, we can be really specific. We need to know about head and neck surgeries, heart surgeries, you know, brain surgeries, intubation. Um, we don't need to know surgical history. And this, this is an interview question a lot of the time. Like, tell me your surgical history. And if you were to ask that to a trans woman, she would be like, huh? Like, you know, don't ask me that or any trans person, you know, instead of just, you know, like, have you had any head and neck surgeries? Have you been intubated? Um, you know, because really what you're, what you need to know about is their vocal function. Um, family support. You know, oftentimes if you've got a patient and they, you know, you're seeing them for MTBI or something, you want to know what their support network is. Ask about their support network. Don't ask about family because family can be a pain point for us because a lot of us are not connected to our, you know, um, families of origin anymore because they don't accept us. Um, things not to bring up with other people unless they bring it up with you include marriage, children, parents, politics, religion, and body image. Those can all be very triggering for us, Barb. You know, we're chatty. Our, you know, speech language pathologists are chatty. We like to talk to our patients. And I do think that, you know, you're talking about like a formal interview is one thing, but also conversational topics. You know, thinking about that you could be bringing up triggering uh, topics, um, thinking about the materials that we bring into a therapy session, thinking about we ask somebody to read a newspaper article and we ask them to summarize it. You know, what, what are the topics uh, that we're bringing bringing into the session and how can we create that safe space? Um, we can't always anticipate how someone might be triggered, of course, but you know, as AC said, there are some sort of common themes and things that we really should be avoiding. And it makes me think of what you were saying earlier in the episode about the lens of trauma um, and, you know, making sure that you are treating the whole person and considering the whole person um, and, you know, not just the, the, the voice modification that they came to see you with and that, that element of safety that's required to do those things. And I wanted to bring up about 
sort of creating the safe space. The space is not just the therapy room. The space in which your clients come to see you or the, the school that they're in, you know, that, that's, that space is big. So, you know, those of the people that are listening are doing the right thing. They're, they're listening to this podcast, but now go forth with this information. Use this information and educate all of the people that your client or your student or whomever is going to be interacting with that person who is trans to help create this safe space. And, you know, the office staff, right? They're the first line. They answer the phone. And I have been so fortunate because the people that I have worked with have just been incredibly um, culturally competent. And what they didn't know, they asked. Um, and they have been to AC's uh, podcasts and they have been to, you know, they, they have sought out this information because they realize how important that is. You know, I know bathrooms are such a loaded issue. I hate to even like talk about it, but it is really important to think about uh, the bathroom signage, space, um, making, uh, you know, our, our clients, our patients, our students, whomever, whatever, whatever setting you're in, um, that they, you know, feel safe there. Um, and I think that, you know, all gender signage, super important. You know, it's, it's, it, a unisex stall is one thing, but usually it has like male, female. That's not all gender, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, then there are some that people try to get cute with that are actually kind of offensive. And I actually Ooh. want to talk to listeners. Yeah, about that. yeah. You know, those us. ones that are like, you know, it'll be like a mermaid and like a zebra with a human uh. head and it'll say whatever. Um, and, that that was sort of supposed to be like a silly nod to like anyone can you know anyone can can use this bathroom we don't care um but that's sort of like the um the saying that people will be like you know we treat everyone equally it doesn't matter who you are um but i like to say you know things like well it does matter who you are and that's why you're trained in culturally responsive practices because you know when we're talking about that trauma informed lens and you know creating safe spaces you know who someone is really does matter and seeing you know a sign that you think like oh that's a cute you know bathroom sign that you know shows that anyone could use this bathroom you want to actually make it a legitimate all gender bathroom sign you don't want to make it something silly and cute that could actually be offensive with you know mm -hmm. non-human um figures um or with the binary like the the skirt triangle person and the legs person like you know what happens to the the people who don't wear either of those things who knows um but you know something that um something that we want to talk about here is is making sure that we protect our our trans um patients clients students from being outed um so you know across settings you really want to be mindful of trans kids being placed into special education programs just because they have gender differences colleagues gossiping about someone's name or pronoun change just shut that down be like that's private mm. outing someone to their insurance company if they're not out to their insurance company and you're seeing them for something else that can be a hardship for them because some insurance companies will drop you or people will see that noted in your chart and it'll be it, you know someone else might discriminate against you um, mentioning information about someone being trans superfluously to providers or caregivers could create an unsafe um, you know space for them if the people on the receiving end either are not affirming or don't know. Um, and making sure that you remind people that it's private medical information, just like anything else. And that goes for like, you know, um, front office staff um, at a clinic and at a school. I mean, school front offices and school uh, and, and school teacher rooms, those are places where a lot of gossip can happen. And, you know, making sure that you like shut down your colleagues, listeners, if they start talking about a kid's transition, because that really like that's private. And if you're, you know, there, there are so many FERPA violations that occur, um, you know, in schools just with regard to this, um, that it's, you know, very um, difficult not to, you know, I, I know that all of you will come across this in your settings, shut it down. Just, you know, that's mm -hmm. private. Um, you know, remember, like, that's a privacy violation. Remember, HIPAA, FERPA is also a thing. Um, you know, and you can, you can talk to, to people about this across, um, across settings. You know, outing kids 
um, to their parents could put them at risk for homelessness. Um, and that's something that, you know, if, if we're banned from homeless shelters and, you know, one third of all um, home, homeless youth identify as, you know, transgender or non-binary, um, you know, what you've done is sort of compounded a crisis there for someone. So let's talk a little bit about forms because we all have forms in all of our spaces and um, it, uh, another way of creating a safe space is creating a safe form and, and some a, a sensitive, a culturally sensitive form. So um, let's talk a little bit about the use of, or the, the question about pronouns. Um, I, I think as we said, uh, it, it's, it's, it is uh, preferred to ask a person their pronouns, not their preferred pronouns. With regards to name, the, the, what I really like is, you know, what name do you want to be called in this clinic? Really? That's, that's really all we need to know, except for insurance purposes. So AC, do you want to talk about that? What is, a, what, is a, what is sort of a safe way to ask a trans person about their, the name that they are insured under? So what I like to advise people on when they're doing their forms is, you know, at the top, name you want to be called in this clinic, pronouns. All sorts of medical information separated out. This is a great safe space signal. You know, when you're asking things like, you know, what brings you in today? This, that, the other thing, you know, do you have a history of, you know, brain injury? Um, that sort of thing. And then insurance information, name on insurance is different from above. And that way you've separated out. So the person knows that the person who's gonna see their chart is gonna call them that name, get their history, and they're gonna ignore the insurance information because that's for the billing people. Um, you know, that's for people who, you know, and if you wanna be super sensitive about that and you actually have an open office, I know we're recording this during COVID, but um, you can say, you know, name you wanna be called in this clinic, um, so let's talk about like the health intake because I, you know I worked in a medical setting so we were very much in a uh, routine of asking a lot of medical questions um, and so we had to really think this through with our trans folks um, and 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 then also now that I'm in a university clinic um, let's talk a little bit about the questions that we ask and I think we've already talked about surgeries so we want to be careful that we're only asking it for information that is relevant to what they're being treated for. So we don't need to need, we need, don't need to know a lot of detail with regards to surgery other than as I think AC said, you know, head and neck surgery or if they've been intubated. Um, with regards to hormones, it's, if it's relevant, it is relevant in the voice world, but maybe not if you're if you're you're treating someone for a completely unrelated uh, uh, issue or, or disorder. Um, what else do you think, AC, that that we should be careful about on on our health forms and in our intakes? You know, I I find that marriage is often asked about on intake oh, forms. Yeah. Are, you mm -hmm. Are you married? 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 Do you want to know if someone has a healthcare proxy or do you want to know if they live alone? Because those are the two things that you're asking with that question. Just ask those questions. Ask what you actually want to know. Or, you know, I think the other extension of that is what communication partners or what, what are in the home or, you know, what else about the home environment is relative to the clinical work that you're doing, not, you know, your marriage certificate or, or relationship status. Right. Absolutely. So, you know, as SLPs, we do a lot of documentation, probably a lot more than we like to. Um, but, you know, sort of uh, piggybacking on that whole, you know, use of language and being sensitive. Um, let's talk a little bit about note writing. And, you know, when is it appropriate? Is it ever appropriate? to say to explicitly that our client, patient, student is transgender. You want to comment about that, AC? I mean, it's not necessarily ever necessary right. to write that in a note. Um, you know, if you're in a, um, you know, I'm going to talk about being in a setting that isn't a voice setting because yes. most mm -hmm. listeners are, are not going to be, you know, primarily voice therapists. Um, you know, in any setting, you don't have to write that someone's transgender in their note. I mean, you don't. Um, you know, you can redact their gender and their pronouns entirely and even their name and communicate the same information in a note. Um, you know, 
you don't ever want to like put someone's name in quotation marks next to next to another name. Um, you don't want to necessarily dead name, which is you know um, you don't want to dead name your client in their notes because that's that isn't doesn't feel right. You know you can call them client or you can call them patient or you can call them you know um, by their first initial and last name, um, but you don't you don't want to use their dead name and you don't want to explicitly state that they're transgender. Um, you know you can you can redact a note to just the information and none of the none of the pronouns or none of the you know is a you know 51 year old you know woman who's had a stroke you know you don't have to say that you can just say is a 51 year old patient who had a stroke so let's talk about how we can be active allies how can we continue as we said this is this is a long term journey of competency this doesn't just stop here we all need to to think about how we can develop further develop our cultural competency so do you have some thoughts ac um, well, obviously, I want people to subscribe to my transplaining platform and come and to they the should. trainings. Yes. Um, but there are so many other amazing foundational trainings out there. Um, you know, I would, because I'm a research nerd, um, I would tell people to go look at the GLSEN um, uh, and Trevor Project and all those types of um, survey this, just to see what the, how their you know workplace kind of compares and what people experience in their workplace before they decide what other foundational trainings they might want but there's all sorts of websites out there where you can learn how to practice with pronouns um, and there's the transgender training institute which is another cultural responsiveness platform um, that actually doesn't have um, an slp training up and I don't know why. And then there's the World Professional Association of Transgender Health, um, the WPATH, and they've got their standards of care list and listed. And if you're going to provide um, gender aligning voice services or any gender voice services, um, you actually need to meet their standards of care, which um, include um, having ongoing cultural responsiveness training. Um, and we've got a list of books. Um, I, Barb, are these the books you like? I, you know, I- These are the books that I like. And I know that we're not, you know, today, we're, this is gonna be for future that we're gonna talk more about gender affirming voice therapy. But, you know, the, you know, I love to call it the Bible, but the Adler, Hirsch and Pickering uh, <laughs> I call book. I the Bible too. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. Um, you know, it's, you know, My it's green now- Bible. Yes, it's now in its third edition, which is Voice and Communication Training for the gender, gender, uh, Transgender Gender Diverse Client. The other one that I, re and there's so many good ones, but the other one that I really, really, really love um, is the Mills and Stoneham one, mm -hmm. uh, the voice book for trans and non-binary people. You picked because, my two favorites from the five that I picked. Well, you know, <laughs> but you know, the reason why I love that one is because it's, it is just written in, in real really, really, really um, simple terms. It was actually written for both the SLP and for trans individuals who are looking to modify their voices. Um, so I think it's a really good start. And um, I, I would recommend if someone, if, if, if people are thinking about doing this type of work, that maybe even just to start there and purchase that one, it's also, you know, it's only like $25 on Amazon. So uh, I, you know, I, I, that's always a good, <laughs> a good route to go. Yes, that's great. And we can put all of these references up on in the show notes. So anyone who's listening can just open their podcast podcast player or go to our website and see, mm -hmm. um, you know, quick access to some of these additional resources. But obviously, we hope people will come back and listen to our next podcast when we delve deeper into gender affirming voice therapy. Guys, I'm not allowed to say that I have a favorite episode, but this was so great. I, I you feel say like that to everyone. <laughs> okay. There's recording. I do not. I do not. I recorded evidence. But, but this is. I, I feel like this has been such a great um, opportunity to really look behind the. You know, the, talk about the really important work that you do before you do the work. You know, as clinicians, we think of the work as servicing our clients, but there is so much more to it. Um, and I am so grateful for your time. Thank you so well, we, much for coming. Well, we Thanks. certainly appreciate you taking the time to talk with us. We obviously feel very passionate about the subject. Can it's you tell? awesome. <laughs> 
I, it's, thank it's you been so, so much great. for having us. I, I love, you know, having the team approach and talking about, you know, the cultural responsiveness and then, you know, hopefully listeners will, will come back and, you know, hear us talk about, um, hear us talk about actual voice services. I, 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 hope, I, they will. I hope they will. I, I also feel like so many of the things that you talked about today were really nice, actionable steps that we can all take to make our clinical environments more inclusive, regardless of whether we're voice therapists or not. Exactly. Uh, yes. So I really appreciate your time. I really appreciate everything that you shared with us today. Thank you so much. And to anyone listening who wants to learn more, like I mentioned, there's information in the show notes and up on our website. Um, and AC also has this incredible platform, Transplaining, um, where he has so many additional resources, webinars, classes every month, different tiers that you can participate. Um, and, and, you know, I can't say enough about it. I've attended several of them myself. Um, it's affordable. It's a really great platform where you can continue to do some of this work. So definitely check it out. We'll have links to his platform all over our stuff. Um, Before we wrapped up, I also, um, since we saw so many incredible visuals today through um, this presentation, um, because as we mentioned, through transplaining, um, there are a multitude of continuing education opportunities um, and PowerPoint slides. And AC and Barb enough were, um, they were generous enough to show us some of these visuals. So since this is an auditory only format and there isn't the opportunity for our listeners to see the visuals as we were discussing them, I wanted to take a minute to walk you through um, some of the important information that is available on um, the Transplaining website, as well as some of the other resources that were listed. On the transplanting webpage, um, there are a variety of options available, including a library of resources. Some of these resources will be posted in our episode notes, uh, in our show notes, but I definitely recommend that you check out the library available on transplanting. There are links to publications through ASHA, the Trevor Project, translanguageprimer.org, learntheirpronouns.com, um, and uh, mypronouns.org, and a variety of other um, links that are incredibly helpful, as well as book recommendations um, that we definitely recommend that you check out. It's impossible for us to list all of these incredible resources in our show notes because the list is so exhausted. Um, and it's really important to us that we leave our listeners with uh, additional places where they can learn more information. So aside from those online resources, and books. Um, there are there are also services that Transplaining provides if you are interested in having um, a culturally responsiveness training um, at your work in, at your work setting, um, or if you are interested in having um, a one to one conversation or having mentorship. Um, there are a variety of different options for you. You can um, take an intro, take a safe space workshop. You can schedule a consultation. Um, with AC, you can schedule, as I said, a cultural responsiveness training seminar um, for your work environment. There are also additional courses and trainings that you can take um, through Transplaining and their uh, Patreon membership. Um, some of these courses are awesome. I've, I, as I mentioned, I've taken a few, everything from intake forms, uh, information and training for K through 12 providers, training about pronouns. Um, training related to inclusive AAC materials, um, inclusive therapy materials, patient, uh, patient and caregiver interviews, um, and general information about allyship. So definitely encourage all of our listeners to check out these really, really great online resources and um, materials uh, available to you through these online sources. So if any, again, if anybody has any questions, feel free to reach out to um, either Amy or myself here, or AC is always open to hearing from listeners and um, answering questions. So you can reach out to him as well at Transplaining on Instagram or through his um, website, Transplaining. So thank you again, everyone, so much for listening. And we're so glad that you, um, that you, we're so glad that you participated today. <laughs>